he is at thy right hand. Thy mercy, Lord, is great and far above the heavens. Let none be made ashamed and wait upon thee. Our hymn of adoration in the Advent you sing is 187, The Youth of the World. Been standing for the scripture reading. The scripture reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 to 18. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, but yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory why we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things are not, which are not seen are eternal amen
We will now invite our church to turn to someone next to you. We'll have a season of prayer. We're going to pray for the young people standing up for leadership. Many are called, few are chosen. We pray that the young people will answer the call when they hear the voice of God. So we ask you to pray for them and pray for those who are supporting them. We'll spend two minutes doing that and then I will pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we have prayed for the young people that they may hear your call and respond to your call. Now, Father, we pray for ourselves, those who are supposed to be good examples, those who are teachers, and those who you've entrusted with your message and your word. We are not perfect in any way but you are perfect. We ask you to stay close to us so that everything that we do and say may glorify your name and your name alone. Be with those who will bring the messages to us today, Shanique and Clara. Bless them, help them to be vessels of your word and help it to be expounded very clearly so that they themselves and all the hearers may hear and respond accordingly. 
We thank you for bringing us here together. We know that there are health challenges within our church and around our community. We thank you for the victories thus far, and we ask you to continue to bless those who are still struggling in any way with any affliction, because we know you love us with a love that we cannot understand. But stay close to us, Lord, and be with us. See us through this program, see us through this day, and help us again to remember you in all things. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The pleasure is mine to welcome each and every one of you to our Youth Week of Prayer. I hope you would be blessed by today's service. And to our visiting members, we would like to welcome you. The names are Anthony Thompson from Barbados. Can you please stand? Clarion Haynes from Canada, the cruise ship. Can you please stand? Hello. Humphrey Pisas Kiraso. And Ken Kurth Richardson from Kiraso. Can you also stand? Brother Lionel Sun. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. The Great Flood in March of 1974, the coastal city of Tuvalu in southern Belize was dis devastated by a flood. Days and more days of terrestrial rain brought devastation to the city. In undating homes, bridges, and railroad tracks, while bringing death to many. So many bodies were never recovered. Having been swept out to sea, approximately 65,000 people were left homeless and all utilities were down. All hope of recovery was seemingly dashed. The flood was no respecter of, pe of persons the long bread line set up by the federal authorities stretched for blocks. Most remarkably was the fact that people of all social classes were side by side in those lines. All having been reduced to poverty instantly, rich and poor, we are now exactly equal. Having a single common denominator being homeless and penniless. How fragile are the lines that divide the supposed social classes? Today, more than 40 years later, Tupara has come back, but those who lived through that experience still have many stories to tell. Undoubtedly, they have learned the lessons that all victims of tragedy have that our possession and even our lives are fragile and subject to the whim of natural disaster, and that our, alleged, uh, our allegiance belong to God and his work. Given to the conference, advanced offerings help provide for such service, such as this disaster relief, Certain evangelistic projects help from our camps and re <clears throat> retreat center and our very worthy cause, considering a liberal offering today. Deacons, please take your position. Pathfinders. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear kind of assembly, Father, as the offering is being picked up today, Lord, I'm asking to help that you may be able to further your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We will now be favored with special music by Miss Haynes.
Good morning, everyone, and a happy Sabbath day to you. My name is Clarence Haynes, and I am visiting from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and I'm here on the Carnival Fascination in your harbor. It's my very first time in St. Martin. But you know what? God is an awesome God. I have been sailing since Sunday, and this is my final stop because I leave tomorrow to go back. And I said to the Lord, out of the seven days, I'm going to give you yours. I'm going to pack up everything. I know I won't be able to shop on the island because by four we have to be on the ship. So I won't be able to say to nothing. But that's all right. Because being here on the Holy Sabbath day is enough for me. And God has chosen the uh, Phillipsburg SDA church for a reason. I had no idea out of all of the Adventist church on the island where I'm going to be. God chose this one. And I believe he brought me here with a blessing for you. Amen. So this morning I'll be singing one of the songs, the very first song I've written. It's also been um, nominated for an award of my album and it's called You Reign Supreme Lord. I'm here to remind you this morning, no matter your circumstances, God reign supreme and he wants you to be reminded of that. Amen. May your heart be blessed. my soul from hell and Lord I can't refrain from praising you so well for you are holy God you are marvelous you Jehovah oh Lord the King of Kings you are lovely the omnipotent Lord, you the King of kings and 
And now we will have a second item of special music by Sister Candice and Sister Abigail. Success to show no glory of my own, yet in my weakness, He is there to let me know His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll 
will carry us when we can't carry on. Grace in His power, though we become strong, His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. We can only know the power that He holds when we truly see how deep our weakness goes. His strength in us begins when ours come to an end. He hears our humble cry and proves again. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can carry on. Grace in His power, though we become strong, His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. Throughout this week, we've been having some power messages by some young people. The Youth Week of Prayer. There are some of you here who were not uh, with, with us either at all or maybe some of the nights. But just so that we can acknowledge them, every pathfinder and every youth who presented a message throughout the week from Sabbath until last night. Could you please stand so that everyone can see you? Is that everyone? These young people delivered some messages. If you were there, you would have goosebumps. They were wonderful messages. And on behalf of the AY department, I would like to say thank you, Pathfinders and young people, for being so brave. This morning, you may be seated. This morning, I again have the privilege of introducing the, the messengers for today. The first, we will have a, a junior message, junior reading. Moses at the banqueting table. And this will be presented by 15-year-old Shanique Arundel. She's in the Pathfinder Pioneer Pathfinder Club guide class. She attends the St. Martin Academy. And she has a very interesting future ahead of her. She's interested in becoming a psychologist or a forensic scientist. We have some big things that she's going to live up to. We're looking forward to this. The second reading will be presented by someone else. Just before I say a little bit about that person, last Sabbath we had Global Youth Day. And, so, and someone shared a concept with us called Time for an Apple. I don't know if you saw a poster that said time for an apple anywhere. But it was a, a wonderful concept. Elder Rooms and some of the youth, Sister Kamika and others, we were on the bush road giving out apples and a book 
a very interesting book. And sometime later, Sister Illich will tell you about that book, a wonderful book. But the time for an Apple concept was a wonderful concept, and we'll introduce it again sometime in the future. But this person obtained her undergraduate degree in elementary education at the University of the Southern Caribbean, where she graduated with honors in 2011. Straight out of university, she began her teaching career as a first grade facilitator at the St. Martin Seventh-day Adventist School. The following year, she became a certified media coach, and four years later, she obtained her post-HBO diploma in school management. This year, Clara George graduated with her master's in education, focusing on integrating technology in the classroom from the Walden University. She currently serves as the school principal at our local school, the Seventh-day Adventist School. However, when asked what, her greatest what was her greatest accomplishment, her remark was being able to make her parents proud and serving as a role model for other young people. Clara is the only daughter of brother and sister, brother Gregory George and sister Marina George, and is a teacher of the young adult class upstairs in Sabbath School. Her desire is to encourage everyone she meets to develop a long lasting relationship with Christ and seeing them saved in his kingdom one day. So I will present to you Sister Shanique Arundel and Sister Clara George. Before Shanique, the first presenter, comes, we will sing our theme song, Pass It On. It only takes a spark. And we're going to try to Lift the roof with our voices. Oh, 
shouted from the mountain top. I want the world to know the light of love has come to me. I want to pass it Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, church. Have you ever imagined what heaven would be like or look like? When I imagine heaven, I think of gold everywhere, some, maybe some white hair in there. It is impossible to know exactly what heaven looks like, but it's a good thing to imagine what it would be like where we're aspiring to go. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to see another Sabbath. Please help that I speak clear and so that everyone could understand me. Amen. Many years ago, a 17-year-old girl named Ellen Harmon, later known as Ellen White after marrying James White, received a vision from God that showed what heaven looked like. One thing she saw was a table. In Revelation 19.9, it was referred to as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hear what young Ellen wrote about the table. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went to the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will. Suffered for me. Come into supper, for I will gird myself and serve you. We shouted, Hallelujah, glory, and entered into the city. I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet, you could, yet you, our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manan, almonds, figs, pomegranate, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. I asked Jesus to let me eat of the fruit. He said, not now. Those who eat of the fruit of this land go back to earth no more. But in a little while, if faithful, you shall both eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink of the water of the fountain. And he said, you must go back to earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. Extracted from Early Writings, chapter 19. <clears throat> See what I mean? Impossible to imagine. How can the table be miles long, but yet you can see the other end? But that is just to show the tremendous joys God has in store for those who want to be in his holy place. We wish and pray that our family and friends will be in heaven. But just imagine sitting at a table miles long with Adam, Eve, Joseph, and other great Bible characters. Imagine dining with Jesus in heaven. Have you ever thought of who you want to speak to after talking to Jesus? I don't know about you, but I want to speak to Eve. I would like to know why or what inspired her to eat the fruit. All this sounds wonderful to me. Our aim right now and forever is to be godly leaders. We'll be able to follow our leaders faithfully, especially God. As a matter of fact, you're already leaders because you're a child of God. Did you know that? What do you want to do when you get to heaven? Just imagine sitting at the, t the silver table listening to faithful people of all time tell their stories. It would be amazing to know their reaction to everything that has happened to them. Also, it's really important that everyone understands that only God knows who is going to be in heaven. 
In modern days, leadership is usually gained from heritage, fame, and fortune. But things don't really work like that in God's perspective. Anyone can become a leader. For example, Moses. After Pharaoh passed the law, Moses' mother didn't want him to be killed. She decided to hide him in the bushes by the river Nile. And God has had plans for him to be a leader before his birth. Even while Pharaoh was executing baby boys, God protected Moses because of the plans he had for him in the future. He was a leader in spite of his rough beginnings. Not because your beginnings were rough doesn't mean you weren't destined to be a leader. Look beyond, grab the call, and move on. A leader looks, for people, looks out for people in harm's way. As a leader, you should never watch someone being hurt by others. Youth tend to bully other youths be who are weaker. And as a godly leader, you should never just stand there and watch that happen. Moses was being a good leader when he saw an Egyptian overseer beating a, he a Hebrew. And knowing it wasn't right, stopped the overseer right away. The outcome of his actions wasn't necessarily the right way. But when you can help someone, help in whatever way is legal. You can't let wrong do what it wants if you know right. A leader will always start off by giving excuses. Moses used his stammering as an excuse to not go to Egypt, but God always has alternatives. God sent Aaron, Moses' brother, to speak for him. Can Moses find an excuse for that? No. He willingly yielded and did as told. Basically, all excuses we have for anything God wants us to do, he is always ready with alternatives. So you go ahead, try your excuses. God always equips the call. A leader never stops trying. Leaders should never give up on what is right. You should always be prepared to keep trying until you've accomplished your goal. God never gave up when he wanted his people out of Egypt and neither did Moses. Moses could have let God use someone else, but instead he stayed and never gave up. As youth, your tasks may not be as hard as Moses' was, but whatever it is, school, housework, etc., never stop trying. Perseverance is a quality that God excels in. A good leader helps others even if it isn't beneficial to them. One should never help someone for something in return. Instead, you should help from the willingness of your heart. After leading the second generation to the promised land, he didn't get to go in because of his sin. He paid the price of physical death, but got the gift of eternal life with Jesus. As leaders, we may fall, but confess your sins and God's purpose will stand. You gain a reward, not necessarily earthly, it can be spiritually. So get up, dust off, and move on. Before I close, I leave you with a quote from Leonard Ravenhill, which Jesus exemplified in his time on earth. And I quote, A true shepherd leads the way. He does not merely point the way. Unquote. To convert someone, it is best to take them by the hand and guide them. Be a leader for God and God only. That alone can take you a long way. So, live up to your calling. Be the leader today. Before the second reading, we have another item of special music by the Mark Sisters.
another one here. And uh, Okay. Can we get another one too, please? Can we get another one too? Sing a new song to the sing a new song to the sing a new song to the Lord Sing a new song to the Sing a new song to the Lord He to wonders be joy sin is triumph was beautiful amen to God be the glory no matter how many times I come in front of here before God's people I am forever nervous but God is good you're gonna help me this morning let us breathe in and exhale this time when you do it you're gonna inhale and you're gonna tell me which direction the wind is going let's go inhale exhale follow the wind with your finger where's the wind going some fingers going this way some going that way, some went up, 
The wind is invisible. Can we see the wind with our eyes? Can you see it with your eyes? No, we cannot. Young, handsome, bold, and rich. The prince was the most eligible young man in the kingdom. Here to the vast fortunes. Educated in the best schools, brilliant, good-looking, strong, and full of charisma. Wouldn't you say, check out the prince? But of course, some knew that he was the adopted son of the princess. They had heard the story of how he was rescued from the river. Drawn out, hence his name, Moses. But once he was in the palace, Moses became the pride of the kingdom destined to become Pharaoh, the most powerful person on earth. Becoming a Pharaoh was no easy task. It involved military training, social and diplomatic coaching. But while Moses was an ardent student, he could not participate in their worship. And for that, his crown was threatened. Moses, oh Moses, what will he do? Will he choose the fate? to take all that he can see with his human eyes, the fame, the success? Or will he rather choose to see with the invisible eye? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as I come before your people, I ask in a very special way that you may speak through me. May this message touch the lives, especially of our young people, and may we leave here willing to see with the invisible, see the invisible with the eyes of faith. Jesus, I may pray. Amen. During his early years, while, in his while with his natural mother, Moses learned some of the most important stories that will help him throughout his life. Now it is often said, train up a child in the way he or she should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Young people, how many times have we heard this? Parents do not get tired because we will see here from the life of Moses that because of his early training, he was able to choose to see the invisible. The lesson of faith that Moses learned as a child stayed with him, and he was determined that by God's grace, he too would be faithful. No threats and no rewards would entice him to give up his faith in God. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, we are given the behind-the-scenes glimpse into how this young man could turn away from what appeared to be such an incredible future. Moses was filled, sorry, Moses was fitted to be among the earth's riches, to shine in the courts of the most glorious kingdom, and to sway the scepter of his power. His intellectual greatness distinguished, it, distinguished him above the great men of all ages. Yet, with the world before him, he had the moral strength to refuse this flattering lifestyle, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. By God's grace, Moses looked beyond the magnificent palace of Pharaoh and the throne to something much, much better. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But what was Moses' reward for choosing to follow Christ? Well, we know today that because of his choice, Moses is alive in heaven. Now, don't get me wrong. If I was given this opportunity, I kind of wonder what it is that I would have chosen. And young people, let us not be so quick to judge Moses. In fact, let me ask you a few questions today, looking at some of our modern, famous, and rich persons. Okay, 
Of course, looking back, it would seem easy. Yes, Moses made the best choice. But if we were faced with a similar situation, what would we do? Can we move to the next slide and skip the video, please? Okay. If you were to visit Egypt today, you would come face to face with the pharaohs. Located in the Royal Mummy's Hall of Fame, I'm not sure how many of you would like to visit there. I don't think I would. But if you go there, you will have the opportunity to see some of the mummies, such as Ramses the Great and Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut, it sounds like I think that's the name. And it's widely believed to be the princes who adopted Moses. That's the image of them there. Do you think you want to go and visit? I am definitely not interested in going and visit. So looking back, most likely if Moses had chosen, listen, I want to continue, that would have been his end result. Now thousands and millions of people go there every year to visit, so that means that you will probably be famous too. But looking at that compared to heaven, which one would you choose? Definitely heaven. Next slide. All right, we're going to look at some of our modern famous persons we have, and I want you to tell me if you would trade places with them today. And be honest, young people, even the older ones, I have some for you too. Okay, the first one is Beyonce. Okay, young people, Beyonce. She's a famous singer. Beyonce has collected 22 Grammy Awards in her 20-plus years career in music. In 2008, she married Jay-Z, who has won 21 Grammy Awards on his own to date. Beyonce and Jay-Z together, their networks combined, go back one slide, combined equal to a total of more than $1 billion. Who would like to trade places with Beyonce? All right. Okay, so maybe not. Can we go back one slide, please? For the older, the older ones, the women especially, Oprah Winfrey. How many of us would like to change places with Oprah Winfrey? She has been challenged by Trump to run for U.S. president in 2020. Oprah is considered one of the world's most powerful women and the richest. Her salary for the Oprah Winfrey show is said to be over $300 million. Who wants to trade or inherit Oprah Winfrey's success? Some of y'all are not being honest in church, but that's okay. All right, then the last one I want to talk about, of course, we have Barack Obama, but before him, for the young men, let's look at LeBron James. Where are my young men? LeBron James. Now, LeBron James will reportedly make $52 million from endorsements in 2018, in this year. All right? And he has signed a lifetime deal with Nike in 2016 that is worth over $1 billion. Would you like to trade with LeBron James? Okay, I see at least two honest hands going up there. All right. <laughs> okay? So, of course, looking back, it is easy to see that Moses made the right choice. But at that time, it wasn't so clear. Had he gone with everything he saw, with his human eyes, the splendor, the fame, the wealth, the power, he would have been the richest, most powerful person on earth. Okay. Even after making the enormously important decision, however, Moses still had several lessons to learn and unlearn. Convinced that God had called him to deliver his people, Moses set out to do just that, in his own strength. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. We shouldn't be so Yes, and he hid him in the sun. Now we shouldn't be so quick to judge Moses. After all, he had received expert training in warfare, and he may well believe that what he was doing was in God's favor. Nevertheless, we know what happened next. Moses did not receive the support of his people. 
and Pharaoh learned of the murder, and the former Egyptian prince had to flee for his life. How many times have we attempted doing things in our own strength? And how has that turned out for us? Especially when we think, listen, God is probably calling me to do this work, and we set out to do it in our own strength, we are bound to, we are bound to fail. So dear old Moses, he had to learn the very hard way. I myself have tried numerous times to do things in my own strength. And over and over, I had to learn that I had to depend on God and also depend on my friends. So Moses, after killing the Egyptian, ran away. And then came his wilderness experience. Forty long years in the wilderness. You might, think that's, <laughs> you might think that's a really stern punishment. But for 40 long years in the wilderness, poor Moses had to go about watching sheep. Here comes my sheep. Poor Moses had to go about watching sheep. And you can imagine what a turn this must have been for Moses. First being the prince, and now in the wilderness, far away, watching sheep. And my sheep are behaving well, but you can imagine the sheep back then. All right? So poor old Moses, watching the sheep. It must have seemed to him that he had ruined everything, that he went from the palace to the pasture, and self-made defender and deliverer to a humble fugitive. Surely he must have asked himself, what went wrong? Yet all was not lost. God had a plan for Moses. What did I say? Just like he has a plan for you, young people. The Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Fresh out of Pharaoh's school, Moses was not ready to lead God's people out of Egypt and into the promised land. He first had to learn not to rely on his own wisdom and strength, but instead to trust in God's power for the fulfillment of his promises. He also needed to learn patience and self-denial, lessons that could only be learned away from the provisions of the palace. When I taught grade one, we were, because it was at an Adventist school, we always tried to integrate faith and learning. So when teaching simple machines, there was a beautiful illustration that I often did with my boys and girls. Now this morning, I have young Tatum, he's going to help us with that. Here we have Brother Tatum, can you stand? This is Brother Tatum, and he represents all of us. Who does he represent? All of us. Okay, he represents all of us. And on the floor is the mission, the task that God has given us to do. Now Brother Tatum is going to try within his own strength to lift that heavy box of blocks. How is it, Brother Tatum? How is it? It is very, very difficult. I can just imagine. However, the Lord promises us that by his might, not by our might and our power, but by who is on the, on the screen, but by my, but by my, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So here we have a hand trolley, and this represents the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to try again, Brother Tatum, to see if we can move this heavy box of boxes into the room. All right, there we go. All right, now I want us to pay attention to something here. What does, who does Alfie represent? All of us. The hand trolley, what does that represent? The Holy Spirit. And the boxes? Our mission. Now let's take him out of the equation. Let's take us out of the equation. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the books. Are they moving? They can move, but the Lord is not going to do for us what we can do for, our, for ourselves. So that is why God calls on us, together with him, to move the Lord. Now recognize something also. Go ahead and, and move it back over. Okay. Just go 
this one, come back. All right, now he's moving it. He's moving it. Did the mission become easier? And oftentimes, because he's moving it, we tend to take the pride and the, the, the glory for ourselves. But if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, would he have been able to move that box of blocks? No. So through the help of the Holy Spirit, our mission that God has called us to do becomes that much easier. Amen? Thank you, Brother Tatum. Rather than being wasted, God used those 40 years in the wilderness to prepare Moses for the great work of leading his people out of slavery and beyond. It was during those quiet years that Moses got the inspiration from God to lead his people to, out of slavery. And it was during those 40 years that he was able to write the book of Genesis. Now, how many of us are in our wilderness experiences today? Are you in the wilderness? Is it that you lost your job? Is it that you're failing math class or chemistry? Is it that you or your loved one is currently sick? And what are you doing in your wilderness experience? Are you moping and crying and feeling self-pity? Are you feeling sorry for yourself? What did Moses do during his wilderness experience? Tell me. What did he do? Sorry? He prayed and he sought God out. It was not during his prominent years in the palace that Moses learned to understand the voice of God. It was during his wilderness experience. It was during when? His wilderness experience. Sometimes, brethren, we need to thank God for the wrong things that are going on in our lives. And give him praise and use that opportunity to rely upon him. Use that opportunity to really get to understand his voice, to discern what exactly it is that he wants us to do. Thank you, Moses, and thank you, sheep. Then suddenly, his sheep watching life was over, just like that. Bam! God often calls us just like that. A phone call, a text, an email, a personal invitation. In the case of Moses, God's call came through a burning bush. Now, I don't know about you, but if the bush was speaking to me, I was running. But because Moses spent that 40 years recognizing whose voice? God's voice, even the burning bush did not scare Moses. Now, you would think after Moses was so brave to listen to the bush, that after the bush told him to go, that he would go. But instead, he said to make up all sorts of excuses. But I can't talk properly. You can't find somebody else. And I laughed when I was going through this sermon because it reminded me of myself. When I felt the call to become the school manager, I came up with every sort of excuse. I cried and I bawled. And I said, Lord, but I'm young. I don't like confrontations, I'm not bold, and I came up with every single excuse there was in the book. But just like Moses, when we choose to allow God to fill us, and when we, use to, when we allow God to see our limitations and yet still trust him to see the invisible, he is able to do wonderful things through us. What, I, what do I say, young people? He's able to do what? Wonderful things through us. Moses recognized his weakness. And there are some beautiful lessons we can learn from his experience. Let us turn our Bibles to chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. We're going to read together Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 to 16. It's on the screen. Let us read together. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither Verse 11. Verse 13. All right, let us pause there. Now recognize something. 
This is a conversation between who? God and Moses. And there are some beautiful lessons that we can learn from this simple conversation. The first one is that many times we lose out on our blessings because we do not have faith and trust in God. Do you recognize that God was willing to take away his stuttering? Do you recognize that God was saying, I am God. I control the deaf and the mute. I give you power to speak. So Moses had the opportunity to lose that stuttering. But instead, he did what? He had doubts and he did not have faith. And because of that, he lost out on his blessing. But there's an the opposite side to that very same story that we can learn today. We are not self-sufficient. God did not create us to work and operate in and of ourselves. If so, we would have no need for God and no need for each other. So there we were. Who, was, who did God select for Moses? His brother Aaron. And it's beautiful because there you see that Moses still, is still humble. He recognizes, I cannot do this on my own. The next lesson is to choose young people. Your parents always say what? Choose your friends. You always hear it. Choose your friends wisely. From this story, there's an addition to that. Allow God to choose your friends for you. Allow God to choose your friends for you. He, God was the one who said, consider your brother Aaron. He can speak well. Why not have him as your friend? And last but not least, God was with him. God was what? God was with him. If God gives us a task to do, recognize he's not going to leave you to do that task on your own. He will be with you. Throughout his life, Moses carried with him the faith-filled ability of making choices based on eternal realities, rather than on the visible yet temporal. Even at the end of his earthly life, Moses urged the children of Israel to be faithful to God, saying, would that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would discern their future. Now Moses, of course, was not the only person in the Bible who exercised faith. Can you tell me some other persons who exercised faith? Abraham, Esther, come on, Joseph, and the list goes on. Let us focus on Noah. The spirit of prophecy says that before it rained, and when Noah was saying it's going to rain, they didn't know what rain was. It's like me telling you, kush kush gonna come. Kush kush gonna come. Do you know what is kush kush? I just made that up. All right, so it's as if Noah is out there, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, and nobody knows what it is. Yet still, nice what? Noah exercised faith, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, young people, Noah exercised faith. He chose to see the invisible through the eyes of faith. And the list goes on. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, and on and on. The Bible says that these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them, where? Are far off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. But the greatest example of all came from, came from Jesus. And it is just beautiful. Can we go to the slide with the lady at the well? When Jesus came to Jacob and see a Samaritan woman, he saw a person in need of hope and forgiveness. Evangelists, do not judge the book the cover heart. Why well, that God looks even beyond our current situation into when we rely on the situation without God's ability to work in your life. Look beyond. If I trust God, this is where he can move me from here to there. So this morning, we want to look at some other characters. The Samaritan woman. Apart from that, we also have the disciples. Next slide. Yes, with the bread and the fish. Now, when Jesus saw the few that he had and the multitude there were that were hungry, it says here that he did not only see that this bread can be multiplied and the fish can be multiplied to feed their physical body, but also their spiritual. And then when he was on the boat and the storm came, how many of us were sleeping during Irma? Okay, so the children were sleeping because they figured my parents are going to protect me. Right? But, but as, as, as we were not sleeping during Irma. But Jesus was there on the boat, busy sleeping away. Why was he able to sleep during the storm? Can you tell me? Because what? 
He had faith in his father. He recognized that even though the storm was a current situation, he was able to see the inevitable through his eyes of faith. He was able to recognize that had I just stand up and say stop, it was going to stop. And the most beautiful story happened when he was on the cross. Now imagine you're beaten, you're bruised, you're about to die, and you're over there saying, I'm going to see you in paradise. Doesn't make any sense to me. Why not paradise, Jesus? You're up there dying, you're sweating, and you're going to die. But he's up there, I'm going to see you, my friend, in paradise. Jesus saw beyond the temporary. Young people, I am challenging you to be like Jesus. I am challenging you to be like all the Bible characters who exercise faith. With our mortal human eyes, we can only see here and now. But when we have faith and we trust in God, we can recognize that the impossible can be made possible through, through him. As I close, I have a few questions to ask you. What about you? What were you looking at? Where are your eyes fixed on? Is it your current circumstances? Is it the people telling you that you can't make it? It is so easy to embrace and focus and be motivated only by the temporary. But could it be that what is so important to you now, popularity, money, sports, entertainment, your job, house, getting a car, may only rot away? In the book of 1 John chapter 2, the apostle urges us to love not the world, neither the things in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth for forever. Amen. We may not be given the royal training, of the future Pharaoh like Moses did, but we are all faced with the choice of enjoying the pleasures of sin today or fixing our eyes on our eternal reward and living our lives according to the promise. Can you please stand with me at this time? I invite you to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Develop a close relationship with him. Spend time with him through his word. If you're going through your wilderness experience, use this opportunity to discern the voice of God and his will and desire for your life. Listen to his voice leading you into active missionary service. Young people, God wants to use you. He wants to use you today. Recognize that coming to church and warming up the pews is not sufficient. It often leads to criticism. Church boring, out there fun. But when you become an active missionary for God, you see things differently. Eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Like Moses, choose today to see the invisible. I'm going to call pastor at this time. So pray for us. As you read the curtains down this afternoon, I'm going to ask our young people to meet me at the altar as I pray a prayer of recommitment on their behalf this afternoon. Young people, Ellen White says that we stress, we stress an army of workers as our youth rightly train. How soon will the message of a crucified risen Savior be preached into all the world? It was Paul who said to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example in conversation, in love, in charity. This morning, young people, you're saying, Lord, I want to be one of those who will be a worker in the vineyard. Today, I want to recommit myself to you. That's a desire. Please come forward as we pray together. We shall sing the song, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the love. You want to say, say I'm in life, life to God. Please come forward as we pray together. God bless you. Thank you. 
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you gave. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave a message. Thank Thank you for the name Washing in my cleansing flow Now all I know Your forgiveness and embrace Worthy is the Lamb Seated on the throne We crown you now with many crowns You reign victorious Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, O oh God, because we sense our need of you. We do thank you today, O oh God, because in Jesus there is always a future. Even now we are brought before you this afternoon, O oh God, our young people. On every side they are being bombarded, Heavenly Father. On every side the enemy is trying desperately, O oh God, to destroy them. But they have come because they sense, oh God, they need you this afternoon. They want to recommit their lives to you, Heavenly Father. Like Isaiah, they are saying, Lord, here I am. Please send me. I pray that you can cover them, oh Father. May you break the chains of the enemy. Beat back the force of darkness, oh Jesus. And may you use them, oh God, to fulfill the purpose that you have called them to fulfill. Some, as last we discovered, are facing many giants in their lives. But we are so thankful today, O oh Father. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. I pray that, O oh God, that we will surround them with your love. May your hands of protection be upon them. As I spoke throughout the week, I discovered that many of you, O oh Father, the sins a need of you. They want to be used by you. And so we ask him today, oh God, that you will use them in a mighty way. Many times as adults, oh Father, we are quick to judge, we are quick to condemn. But it help us as well to sense our responsibility. The calling that you have placed upon us as adults, oh God, to train them, to equip them, and to send them forth as army of young people to conquer the world for you. Oh God, I commit them before you, Jesus. You have called them because they are strong. You have called them because, Lord, they are able. As long as they surrender and have you as a captain of their lives. May you bless every boy, every girl, every woman. And may as they live forth, may as they leave this place this afternoon, they can live the conviction that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Keep them, O oh God, and bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. May God bless you.
This afternoon we say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. I want to thank God for Shanique Arundel for allowing God to speak through her this morning, and also Clara George for allowing the Holy Spirit to work with her also. I am leaving here with two things, two texts. We have no more excuses. Philippians 4.13 says, Philippians 4.13 says, and verse 19 says, My God, all my needs according to his riches in glory. So we have no excuses. When God calls, he equips. And no matter what your challenges are, God is always ready if we are willing and if we are able. I want to also thank God for all the young persons who took part in the work this week. And I pray that you may continue to allow God to use you for his honor and for his glory. Our closing song is 7-0 in the Advent you sing, I Know Whom I Have Believed. Stand, please. Father, we thank you for being with, with us here this morning and for the blessing that you have blessed us with. As we are about to go home, we ask to give us traveling mercies and be with the rest of the program for the rest of this day. We give you all the praise and all the honor. And we thank you for being good to us. We bless you, you for Christ's sake. Amen. <laughs>